Great. Thanks, Maria. And um, thanks so much uh, to all of you for coming. Um, yeah. Uh, I'm really excited to be here, and I'm, I'm really glad to be speaking about this topic. Um, it's a question that means a lot to me, but I also actually find really challenging. Um, and I guess <laughs> all I'm really hoping to do is pass on the challenge to you guys today, um, but also pass on a bit of hope. So we're thinking today about hopeful, how our humans, we are hopeful beings. We are creatures of hope, which means that we can uh, imagine the world different to how it is. Now we're capable of, of seeing how things should be better. And we want them to be better, don't we? I mean, uh, maybe you, ha you have some of those moments where you just look at the world and you think, oh my goodness, you feel the gap between how things are and how they should be. A while ago, I was just watching the news and literally the first five stories, I think, on the news were people dying violently in different ways. And you just sit there feeling like, this is not how it should be. Or through something like um, the Me Too campaign, as you just hear report after report of misogyny and abuse, and you just think, this is not right. This isn't how things should be. And you think, I want to do something, right? We want to do something about it, don't we? But then at the same time, I think if you're anything like me, you actually struggle to hold on to that feeling of, of wanting to go out and do something for very long. Guys, welcome. There are a couple of seats at the front, um, four seats on the front row if you want, um, but also feel free to sit on a table or anything like that. Welcome. Um, but I struggle to hold on to that feeling of, oh, I want to go out and do something. I think we, uh, I really struggle with what psychologists call compassion fatigue, right? I just don't have the capacity for all of the, the pain and the hurt and the stuff that's wrong in the world. You know, for all of the pain that's, that's still happening in the refugee crisis that still hasn't finished or been resolved. The pain in Syria, in that war that continues to, to be horrendous. The war and the famine in Yemen that I hardly even understand. You know, we feel just overwhelmed by all of this stuff that's wrong in the world. And we can kind of feel helpless. And maybe we look at the topic for today and we think, well, to be honest, I don't know how hopeful I'm feeling and, and I'm not sure if... I can actually make a difference. Um, but let me start with a, a cheesy story. There's a, a cheesy old story of a, a man who's walking along a beach and it's covered in uh, starfish who've been kind of uh, stranded there by a storm. And they're stuck. And um, he sees a little girl who's picking up the starfish one by one and throwing them back into the ocean. And he says to her, what are you doing? There must be tens of thousands of starfish on this beach. And when the sun comes up, they're all going to die. I, I don't think that you're going to really be able to make much of a difference. And the little girl bends down and picks up another starfish, walks to the, to the sea, throws it in, and looks at him and says, well, made a difference to that one. And it's a cheesy story, but there's an obvious point there, which is that actually every single one of us can make the world a better place. You know, in all kinds of different ways. I don't know what you're studying, I don't know what you'll go on to do, but uh, building a good bridge makes the world a better place. Caring for a patient makes the world a better place. Helping someone do their accounts honestly and accurately makes the world a better place. Writing uh, a good article or a good bit of code for a computer program makes the world a better place. But maybe there are some of you here who are English students like I was. And you are thinking, well, that's all very well that we can make a difference in whatever employment we find. But what if we don't find any employment at all, right? I know your pain. But I think that the difference, the deepest difference that any one of us is going to make to this world is not fundamentally about what we do. It will be about who we are. It will be about our relationships, how we live, how we love, what it is like to know us. Famously, Mahatma Gandhi said, be the change you want to see in the world. And I don't know about you, but when I hear that, I find it kind of, at the same time, really encouraging because it's like, yeah, actually, you know what? I can change the world. But then at the same time, it's kind of a bit uncomfortable and challenging because I'm thinking, hang on, does that mean I have to change? And I've been wondering about this, and I've been wondering if actually on some level, 
I prefer that feeling of kind of helplessness and being a bit overwhelmed by all the stuff that's going on in the world because it feels then like, well, there's, there's nothing I can do. And that allows me to feel kind of just like a good guy, you know? Like, the problem in the world is that there are just so many of these bad guys out there doing really bad stuff. And there's really nothing I can do about it. And if only there were just more people like us, you know, good guys like us, then, then the world would be a better place. And actually, I mean, it's become a cliche to talk about kind of echo chambers and, and social media and stuff. But this is, this is what the internet is, is like these days, isn't it? All of our thinking about what's wrong with the world is full of this us and them thinking where you kind of say, I, I just can't believe that people would believe that, that people would say that, that people would do that. I don't even understand that. And we think, they're the problem in the world. And, and so we think, well, there's us, there's the decent, reasonable people, and then there's them, and they're the problem. But the problem is, they are thinking exactly the same thing about us. And I think, actually, even if we wouldn't be the sort of person who would post like that on social media or whatever, our instinct when we respond to bad news and problems in the world is, is pretty much the same because when we hear something terrible has happened, we think to ourselves, I can't believe that someone would do that. But what does thinking like that actually do? I think if we're honest with ourselves, a big part of what it does is just to help us feel better about ourselves. Uh, I came across a, a blog recently, um, I, I quoted it yesterday, uh, on Everyday Feminism. It's by an uh, activist and therapist called Kai Cheng Tom, and she is really painfully honest about her own motivations and her experiences uh, in being part of the activist culture that she's involved in. And she says this, and I think it's, we've got to hear her out. She says, we created a culture of toxic confrontation and shaming people for oppressive behavior so that we could focus on the failings of others and avoid examining the complicity with oppression, the capacity to abuse that exists within us all. I think there's an uncomfortable amount of truth in that, isn't there? And it's actually really dangerous. There's a guy called Miroslav Volf, uh, who's a Croatian thinker and writer, and he wrote a book called Exclusion and Embrace, uh, all about the spirals of revenge and conflict in his homeland. And he says that it's this same instinct that it's the, that's at the root of those spirals. He says, we tend to translate the presumed wrongness of our enemies into an unfaltering conviction of our own rightness. And that allows us to justify doing all kinds of things. But just because they are wrong doesn't mean that we are right. And actually, Kai challenges us um, to something I think is really radical in today's culture. She says, I can't create positive change without recognizing and naming my own participation in the oppressive systems that I'm trying to undo. What she's saying is, I am a part of the problem. And the first step to actually making a difference is admitting that, realizing that. Well, listen to it from uh, Alexander Solzhenitsyn. He was uh, a Nobel Prize winning uh, author who uh, for a long time was in uh, the Stalin's Soviet kind of prison camps. And speaking about this idea of us and them, he said, if only we were all so simple. If, if only there were evil people somewhere insidiously committing evil deeds. And it were necessary only to separate them from the rest of us and destroy them. But the line... Dividing good and evil cuts through the heart of every human being. And who's willing to destroy a piece of their own heart? The dividing line isn't between us and them. It cuts right down the middle of me. And if we're honest, we, know, or we all know this in our own experience, right? I hate corporate greed and economic injustice. But in reality, I am greedy too. And actually, how much do I really do to help the poor? You know, I, I hate it when politicians lie and, and twist the truth. But actually, I know that I sometimes bend the truth when it makes things less difficult for me. You know, I, I'm supposed to love my family and my friends, and I really do, and I want the best for them. But at the same time, I find myself genuinely, deeply hurting them sometimes. Why is that? The line between good and evil cuts right down the middle of me. And if the world was full of people like me, it would not be a perfectly happy place. The world is full of people like me. And just look at it. So where does this leave us? 
You know, if, if we abandon the kind of blame game of saying, well, it's, it's those outrageous people over there, and we admit that we're part of the problem as well, does that mean that we just have to shut up and kind of give up on making a difference to the world? And the good news, first bit of good news from today is no, it does not. There is a, a kind of radically different alternative approach to making the world a better place that we can see flowing through human history, and it has changed the world massively. I'm thinking um, of Nelson Mandela and Desmond Tutu in South Africa. I'm thinking of Rosa Parks, Martin Luther King, many, many others. But as you, as you trace it back to its root, we're talking about um, Jesus of Nazareth. And actually, I just want to share with you the, the invitation, the challenge, the, the kind of beautiful challenge that Jesus uh, offered and still offers right now to everyone. And it has changed the lives of millions of people and has in the process deeply changed the world. But I'll, I'll give it to you just in his own words. Jesus said, to you who are listening, I say, love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. Bless those who curse you. Pray for those who mistreat you. If someone slaps you on one cheek, turn to them the other also. Then you will be children of the Most High God because he is kind even to the ungrateful and the wicked. Be merciful just as your Father is merciful. Now that is revolutionary and it's beautiful because it challenges the thing that we have where we say, well, you know, we are, these are my people and when we are attacked, we will attack back. It says, no, love your enemies. And why does that have the power to change the world? Well, there's maybe no one more qualified to talk about that than Martin Luther King. He lived this, he died for this. And listen to what he says. He says, the ultimate weakness of violence, and it's worth saying violence, of course, is not just physical. So many of the words that I speak, that I tweet, that I whatever, are intended to hurt. The ultimate weakness of violence is that it is a descending spiral, begetting the very thing that it seeks to destroy. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence, adding deeper darkness to a night already devoid of stars. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. And then he says, love is the only force capable of transforming an enemy into a friend. Love transforms with redemptive power. So Jesus is saying that every single person here today has the potential to transform the world around us with redemptive power. How? Be the change you want to see in the world. Don't be part of the problem. Love your enemies. And that's concrete, active. Do good to them. Turn the other cheek. That's the only thing that doesn't just add darkness to a night already devoid of stars. But of course, as we say that, we think, that is hard, isn't it? It's too hard. I mean, actually imagine what Jesus talks about with turning the other cheek. Imagine that someone who hates you and everything you stand for has walked up to you and backhanded you across the face. Right? That hurts and it's insulting. And how do we respond when we're hurt or insulted? Maybe not even by an, an enemy, but maybe by someone we really love. I know that when I feel hurt or insulted, how I respond is that something in me kind of twists up inside me and either it ties itself into a little knot and I shrink away in bitterness and self-pity and I kind of retreat from that person or it kind of coils up into a spring and it snaps back and I strike back and try and say something that will hurt them. What would it take to stand firm, look them in the eye and turn the other cheek? What would it take instead of uh, closing off into bitterness to open up in vulnerability and tenderness? What would it take instead of striking back to reach out in love and vulnerability? And I think we've got to admit that we can't do that by ourselves. That is, that's too hard. It's too deep. But Jesus says you don't have to do it by yourself. He says, look at God. God is kind, even to the ungrateful, even to the wicked. He says, I'm not just 
giving you sort of instructions to try and be a better person. I'm telling you this is what God is like. In fact, Jesus says he's not just telling us what God's like, he shows us what God's like. He says, if you, if you want to know what God is, look at me. And so if we look at Jesus' life, what do we see? Well, as we look at his life, we see that Jesus spoke out against oppression and injustice and violence. He challenged authorities. He challenged the crowds. He defended the oppressed and the forgotten. But people did not like that. You know, Jesus was so good that it was, he was like a bright, bright light and it shone right through the facades that we want to put up of being a really good person and it exposed the, the darkness and the messiness and the, the selfishness inside of people and so they said, turn that light out. And people turned on him. Even his friends betrayed and abandoned him. But what do we see that Jesus does? He doesn't run away. He doesn't fight back. He loves. You know, he is falsely convicted and he is beaten to within an inch of his life and he is mocked mercilessly. He doesn't run away. He doesn't fight back. He loves. He is given a wooden cross to carry up a hill so that he can be nailed to it like, an, like a slave, like an animal, and left hanging there exposed to die. He doesn't run away. He doesn't fight back. He loves. In fact, as he's hanging there gasping for breath, he's not calling down curses on the people who are doing this to him. He is crying out, Father, forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. He loves his enemies. He loves them to death. Could that untie the knot inside of us? Could that uncoil the spring? But actually, it goes even deeper than that. It goes even deeper because it's not just those soldiers that Jesus is forgiving. Because actually, every human being, on some level, we, we respond by saying, turn that light out, get it away from me. Because we know there's all of us, there's stuff in our lives that we need to be forgiven for and we don't like to admit it. And maybe, yeah, like them, we don't really know what we're doing. Maybe we don't realize that what we're doing is we're keeping God and Jesus and all of that stuff out because we don't want to see that light. We don't want to see what that shows us about ourselves. But like them, we really do need to be forgiven. Like them, on, on the deepest level, there is a real sense where we are all Jesus' enemies. But what does Jesus do? He doesn't run away from us. He doesn't fight back. He loves. He dies so that we can be forgiven. He takes onto himself the whole weight of all of our selfishness and hatred and darkness, and he dies in the agony of it so that it's dealt with, so that we can be forgiven. His dying love is the only force capable of transforming enemies into friends. And if we really see that, if we get that, that has the power to untie the knot inside of us. That can uncoil the spring and, and give us the strength to step forward like he does in vulnerability and love people, even when it hurts. And um, I've had the privilege of meeting plenty of people in my life who are like that, who have had that transformation and are beacons of that kind of love in the darkness of this world. And last week, I actually met a guy called Hassan John. Uh, this is him. And he's a, a reporter for CNN and also a Christian pastor in northern Nigeria in a town called Jos. And it was amazing hearing him speak because um, he has, he says he's, he's witnessed and reported on at least 96 terrorist attacks and massacres and sometimes slaughters of whole villages. It sounded utterly horrendous. And most of it um, is, is a religious conflict. Um, huge, huge amounts of it is Islamist terrorist groups, extremist groups, um, attacking Christian areas and churches. Um, and in his town, there's the kind of Christian area, and then there's the Muslim area. And there have been clashes. It sounds like the Christians have not at all been perfect in this. 
Um, there have been clashes between them, and you do not go into the Muslim area if you're a Christian, and vice versa, right? And he said that one day, a, a girl came up to him in the day and, and tried to sell him something, and he said, why are you not at school? And she said, because my mum can't afford to send me to school. And he said, okay, well, take me to your mother, and, and I'll, I'll pay for you to go to school. And this girl started to lead him to, back home to her mum, and he realized that she was leading him into the Muslim half of the town. And he thought, <laughs> I don't know what's going to happen to me here, but he couldn't leave her, and he followed her. And he went and he met her mum, and he got to know her, and he started to talk to her. And it turned out that uh, her mum was in a really difficult situation, and actually there were loads of widows throughout the community there who were really struggling to, certainly to send their kids to school, actually to feed their families. And he said, look, well, I want to pay for your daughter to go to school, but actually I'd love to help the others as well. So if you want to come to the church on Saturday, I'll, I'll be there and I can help people, help with their children, and um, maybe we could do some training and stuff as well and help people to think about how to make some money, business skills, stuff like that, so that even, even in your situation you can start to make some money and feed your families. And the first week there was just a handful of them there. By the fourth week he did it, I think there were over 200 women there. And they kept going, and they kept doing it. And now he is good, good friends with the imam in that community. And they, they say, we love you guys. And we will never let anything happen to you or your church or your people because we know that you love us. And if you ask Hassan, why are you doing this? Where did you get the courage to do this? He just says, I was just following Jesus. Just following Jesus. And now Jesus makes it very clear that it's not going to be easy, you know? Hassan has actually got a, a price on his head from Boko Haram. He is a, a target. Martin Luther King was arrested and beaten and eventually killed for this. So were the early Christians in, in the Roman Empire. So are many Christians around the world today as they try and love their enemies. Um, and following Jesus, learning to love like that, will involve getting some wounds like his, whether they're physical or emotional. But I guess that raises the question, doesn't it? It all sounds beautiful, it all sounds lovely, but isn't it just too weak? In a world with such violence and such cruelty, doesn't that just mean, you know, yeah, fine, maybe you're allowed to have police forces and armies and, and stuff on a bigger scale, but still, doesn't that just mean that fundamentally, the powerful are going to crush the good and the, who are making themselves weak, and ultimately, evil and cruelty and injustice is going to be victorious? And this is why Jesus is such spectacularly good news. This is where hopeful comes in, right? Because Jesus took on the very, very worst that evil and hatred and violence can do. As he died on the cross, he faced it head on. That is the bleakest moment in human history right there. And he fights it all, and he does it by letting himself be killed. And then he rises from the dead. He takes it all down into the grave with him, and then he rises again. And that is the dawn of a new day. That is the proof that a new day is coming when God will abolish hatred and the world will be saturated with the precious, tender love of God that God is going to sweep away every injustice and evil and cruelty in this world, that he is going to sweep away every bit of hatred and bitterness and selfishness in every person who will let him and transform us, liberate us to be fully human forever, enjoying each other and enjoying him as we were meant to be wiping every tear away from our eyes. In Jesus, love has actually defeated hatred. Life has actually defeated death. And Jesus looks at every single person in this world and says, do you want to come and be a part of that? Do you want to come follow me? Do you want to be a part of it? So every single person really can. You can really change the world. You can make it a better place. And it starts by coming to Jesus and saying, look, I admit that I am part of the problem here. And I realize that you are the solution. And I admit that I'm not strong enough in myself to fix everything. I can't even fix things in my own, my own heart. But I need you. 
please forgive me. Please change me. I want to be part of your family. I want to be part of your people. And I want you to make us beacons of your love in a world full of selfishness and hate. I want you to make us beacons of your peace in a world of division. I want you to make us beacons of your life and light in a world of death and darkness. And if you ask Jesus to do that, he will say yes, he will forgive you, he will embrace you, and then he'll roll up his sleeves and get to work on you. The uh, African Bishop Augustine once said, hope has two beautiful daughters, anger at the injustice of the world and courage to do something about it. And so my question for all of you today is, do you have the courage to do something about it? Do you have the hope that actually it's really true that Jesus came back from the dead and so we have a solid hope that love is not going to lose, that love is going to defeat hatred and death? And do you have the courage to say, yeah, I want to do something about it? And can I say, some of you have been around all week. Um, it, it's, it, you know, it feels like we kind of know each other. Can I say something just person to person? Can I, can I beg you, please, don't waste your life. Please don't waste your life sitting on the fence with this kind of stuff. You were made for so much more than that. You were made to genuinely be a part of how God is redeeming the whole world. Please don't miss that. Please don't waste that opportunity. And you could today say to God, yeah, I'm in. I'm in. I want to be part of this. So I just want to give you actually a couple of seconds now. Just, I'm not going to say anything for a couple of seconds. Just give you a chance to ask yourself, do I want in? Do I want to do this? And if you do want to do that, that's the best decision you could ever make. It's the best decision I've ever made. And I, I can't wait to see how God uses you to change the world. Um, and if you want to say yes, um, I'd love to chat with you. You should definitely tell somebody that you, you've met that's a Christian. Or come and tell me. I'd love to chat. I've got a little booklet that a friend of mine wrote that's just called Yes. It's basically a, a little taster of what it would look like to say yes to God and get started in that. Um, so if you're, if you're thinking about doing that or you, you want to do it, please do grab me. I've got loads of these. I'd love to give one to you. But for now, we've got time for questions, so why not just turn to the person next to you, say, talk about what stood out to you, what struck you from all of that, and, and what would you say kind of holds you back from thinking, yes, I want to be part of that? What, what questions do you have or objections do you have that make you think, I don't think I could do that right now? Um, and if so, just text them in. We'd love to get through as many of them as we can uh, and explore those with you. So great. Do take a couple of minutes now just with the person next to you uh, to chat those things through and, and text into the number on the screen.
So this is just your two minute warning to get uh, any questions you have in. Great, thanks for your questions. Um, so how can we use love to transform enemies into friends, such as Nazis in World War II? Um, it's just so hard. Great, so this is a, a really, really good question. Basically, it's saying on a kind of big scale of large, violent, evil, like Nazis in World War II, how on earth can you love those people in any way that transforms them into friends? And um, my basic answer to that would be that um, I, I'm still trying to work out h quite how this maps on to sort of political level uh, situations um, because Jesus is clearly giving instructions to individuals, right? It, it wasn't that in World War II it was just Hitler walking up to Winston Churchill and slapping him. You know, that's, that's not what war is like. It's a much bigger thing. And so by not resisting the Nazis, you, you're not actively loving them because it's, it's not a, a personal relationship thing there. So I, I wouldn't want to confidently pronounce on, on uh, and Christians have different views on how this applies to sort of geopolitics and uh, military efforts and whether you're allowed to defend things. And Basically, if you think, oh my goodness, this makes no sense on that scale, then I think it's because primarily Jesus wasn't talking to military commanders. He was talking to human beings like me and you, who actually, the conflicts that we have are with other people who are in front of us. And what he says is that if there is a person in front of you who hates you, if you love them back, it really can transform them into a friend. It won't always, but it can. And if you hate them back, all you've done is allow them to destroy you. So, yeah, thanks for that question. Uh, sorry for not clarifying that earlier. This one's kind of linked. When Jesus says, turn the other cheek to be slapped, is it an image or is it literal? Does it mean we stay passive and accept someone's anger? That's a great question. Um, I think it's, it is an image, um, but I think, I guess it would make sense to, um, the first way that you would apply it is if you actually find yourself in that situation. I think... What you've got to imagine is that situation where somebody is being aggressive to you in whatever way, they are hurting, insulting you in whatever way. And like I was saying, it's that choice between do you kind of just uh, shrink away from the situation? And I know as a, as a British person, often that's more my instinct, is I just want to kind of not talk to them, not look at them, uh, get out of that relationship. Um, or do you want to hit back, get your own back, assert your dominance, 
And actually what Jesus is saying is there's got to be something that's neither of those two options, where you look this person in the eye and you say, look, I love you. And um, like obviously you've got a lot of anger at me at the moment, and if, if it would help you to get that out a little bit more, here's my other cheek. And actually, that's pretty hard to deal with if you're the angry, aggressive person. And um, it has the power to diffuse things, to transform things, because you don't play the same game. Um, so yeah, I think in a case where you're defending somebody else, you know, you, f fair enough, you can restrain somebody, you can stop them, you can do whatever you need to do. Um, but if it's a case of getting my own back, Jesus is saying there's a better way, a much better way. Mm. Can't I just try and love people like that without loving God? Why do I need to be a Christian? Ah, that's a great question. So, uh, you know, if Jesus is saying love like this, isn't the point really that uh, we're, we're all just trying to be more loving people, we're trying to forgive people? What, do I have to actually be a Christian or believe in Jesus to do that? Can't I just listen to his teachings? Um, and I think that's a very, very good question. But I think it's so so important for us to realize that if Jesus isn't real, if he didn't really come back from the dead, if there is no God, then actually there really is no hope. That it, like Death just draws a line under the injustices of life. Any kind of love, joy, peace is a momentary kind of uh, odd one out in a universe of uh, chaos and competition and violence and power. Right? So um, fair enough, it might feel kind of heroic for us to say, well, look, even though I live in that kind of a universe, I want to be a person of love. But can I say the reason that we want to be people of love is that that's what we were made for. And if we try and live it out by ourselves from our own sort of resources, just loving the people around us, ultimately we realize that we don't have the strength to do it by ourselves. I mean, you look, <laughs> look at your own life, look at the world. We don't have it in us to respond like this repeatedly, persistently, patiently. In order to really love like we were made to love, we need to be receiving that love and that strength from Jesus who died to love us. And if that's coming into you, and, and those people who've become a Christian here will know the difference that that makes gradually over time as you receive that love, it's like you can, you can allow that to flow out to other people. Um, in a way that you'd have never been able to do by yourself. And so, yeah, I'd invite you to say, Jesus, I, I want to see what it's like to know your love and to pass that on. Um, because that's a lot deeper than anything that I can do by myself. Last question, would you die for your faith? Yeah, great question. I hope so, yes. Um, because Jesus came back from the dead. Jesus came back from the dead. And that actually means that death is not the ultimate full stop. It's not the kind of sick punchline to the joke of existence. We don't have to fundamentally be terrified of it. Um, and actually, it is, it is more precious to know Jesus and to know that love that will genuinely last forever. That is more precious than life. Joyfully, you don't have to choose because he, ri he raises us to life if we trust him forever. So in a sense, it's actually not that much of a sacrifice. And Christians through history have been able to do that. I mean, the, the early Christians who were thrown in, literally thrown to the lions and uh, the emperors were complaining because the, the one, they, would, they would have smiles on their faces as they lay there dead. And they go, what's, what's wrong with these Christians? This is ruining the whole spectacle. <laughs> because these Christians knew I've given myself to Jesus, and he has given himself to me, and nothing, nothing can take that away from me. And I wonder if, if, uh, if you guys here today have that kind of freedom that says the most beautiful thing in my life, nothing can take it away from me, because Jesus has given it to me forever, for free. And you can have that if you want. So that's why we're doing this week, and that's why... I, I'm here. That's why it's been such a privilege uh, to do these talks is because this is so good. It's actually better than life itself. Um, and like I say, I'd love to chat to you if you're thinking maybe actually this is for me uh, or if you've got more questions, I'd love to chat to you afterwards. Mm. Thank you, Mike, for today Thanks. and for all this week. Thank you. Um,